in the interest of KPL. Morning, Rob. Good morning. And if you want to reserve uh, any rebuttal time, well, actually, there's nobody here, so you're not going to you're not going to need any rebuttal time. Or we want to rebut myself. May um, please support for the record, Andrew Banyan, the County Legal Aid Society. I'm sorry, yeah. Andrew Banyan. Banyan, thank you. Yes, um, the County Legal Aid Society, on behalf of the Maternal Bradford, um, was actually not part of this case, which is one of the reasons that we filed a notice of appeal. Um, Your Honors, I believe that the issue for your consideration this morning is a fairly straightforward one in the sense that we are requesting a hearing on our motion to vacate a final judgment of adoption. Um, as I stand here, Judge, we still do not really have access to the court file, so I would like to, I, I think, maybe a brief synopsis of the facts from our perspective would be appropriate, given that we haven't really had the opportunity to create the factual record from our perspective. Um, Your Honor, can you tell me, based on what we do have before us, yes, Your Honor. it seems evident DCF was involved with both children at some point. Yes, Your Honor. Am, am I correct? There's nothing in our record that indicates where DCF went. Again, Your Honor, I don't have access to court files, so I don't, you know, okay. I don't know, but I know that our client states that DCF placed both siblings in her care initially, and it is her position, and she would present testimony and evidence that it was DCF's preference that she actually retained permanent placement of both the siblings at issue in, in what we, we, we would consider to be the entire matter. The biggest obstacle, of course, is that your intervention motion came about 18 months after the final judgment of adoption. Correct, Your Honor. And it's puzzling as to how your client wouldn't have known that there was an adoption in the process during all that time. Well, she was never provided notice from the court, Your Honor. And that is a direct, I mean, Your Honor, part of the, the issue that I have is I don't have access to the court file. She doesn't have access to the court file. But I would assume that with both parents deceased that the DCF was involved with each of the children because one of them was four years, three, four years old, and one of them was one or two years old? Correct. At the time of the accident? Yes, Your Honor. Um, it was a horrific traffic crash killed both parents, and DCF, again, from our client's perspective, placed both children in her care. I think, Your Honor, um, that DCF probably does have the resources to put out figurative fires, um, but when a maternal grandmother calls and says, you know, we were exchanging visits, we were, we were both having both children go back and forth, but now the paternal grandfather is saying he's keeping the older sibling. That, to them, may be of some concern. Is the younger sibling adopted at this point? No, Your Honor. The younger sibling is not adopted. The younger sibling is an adoption in progress? There was a petition for guardianship of both children filed out of maternal grandmother. The maternal grandmother is not, she's not attempting to adopt the younger child. I thought I read that in the Well, she would eventually, Your Honor. But, but she, it, she, right now, that, that's not in, in process. No, Your Honor. The only thing that, from, from our understanding, that is in process is a petition to adopt the younger child that is still pending. Um, and the instant appeal followed um, the court's direction to provide the maternal grandmother with notice of that action. Um, so, so what is your best argument to, to get around the one year cutoff for this sort of thing with, with uh, from, uh, the, from the grandmother's perspective? How do you, what, uh, that's your biggest problem. Agreed, Your Honor, I'm glad the court asked. The answer I believe, Your Honor, is going to be good, but, which is a case that is more or less directly on point in the sense that it's holding that when a party can demonstrate extrinsic fraud, that denies a party an opportunity to present evidence, an opportunity to appear in court, that that can overcome the statute of opposed section 63.22. Goodman, we don't know that whether the whether the, no, no, the intervention was filed within a year or not. You can't tell. I, I I don't I didn't read Goodman in that way, Your Honor. I, I believe that the, the facts in Goodman are clear that the statute of opposed is overcome. Um, that the filing was after the statute of repose and that, that tell me where you find that. Um, Your Honor, I don't, um, Your Honor, um, I believe that extrinsic fraud. I mean, that as far as the one that, that, that in Goodman, the notice was filed after a year, it doesn't say that. I, I don't have that, I don't have that case in front of me, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Um, I have it here, yes, Your Honor. Um, but my um, that's your that's your argument is based on Goodman. My argument is based on Goodman, Your Honor, and the argument is also based on extrinsic fraud, denying a party in process. 
Um, so where did the fraud come in? If, if, if the grandfather undertakes to do an adoption and he just goes about the business of adopting, where, where's the fraud? Well, Your Honor, the fraud is in the UCCJA affidavit that he filed with the court, in which he, um, he asserted that the that both children had resided with him um, in the 24 months preceding his petition to adopt. Um, and so that's what you would argue if you were given a hearing, you would look at what was filed in support. Yes, Your Honor. Grandfather. The maternal grandfather, the maternal grandmother, Your Honor, would produce both evidence and testimony that the um, that the younger sibling and the older sibling were both in her care um, for a period of six months and 24 months preceding the petition to adopt. Uh, would introduce evidence in the form of daycare registrations, other written documents showing that um, that older sibling was listed as residing her or was actually staying but at her is, address. Is that the kind of fraud that would prevent the grandmother from learning about and exercising some right to vacate earlier than she did? I think it would, Your Honor, in the sense that there is a statute um, entitled Grandparents' Right to Notice at 63.0425. And that statute, Your Honor, is specifically contemplated. Do we know that that would even apply because that, that statute connects it to the term, termination of parental rights petition, which I don't think there was one in this case? Well, Your Honor, that distinction is as a result of the parents being deceased. I think that in any. So you're analogizing the TPR to the, the fact that they're deceased? Your Honor, I think where. Yes, Your Honor. I, I do think that, that effectively rights are terminated judicially. Someone dies. When there is, well, I think that's no. a stretch, counsel. <laughs> well, I, I don't think that, I, I think that's a stretch to, to equate that with the termination of the parental rights. Your Honor, I think that the, the intent of the legislature in enacting a grandparent's right to notice was to make sure that there's no proceeding for a termination of a parental rights. DCF didn't, I mean, we don't have anything in our record that shows that DCF hadn't had filed any sort of proceedings for termination of the parental, the parents' rights here. Well, Your Honor, I, I do believe that it should be equated because I, I do think that effectively terminate rights are terminated when an adoption is completed. And whether the parents are, are dead or not, the, the court has not yet at that point terminated parental rights. That is a judicial proceeding for that that would in effect occur. But even if the court does not agree that that statute is applicable, there is still the due process right that is discussed in Goodman v. Goodman. Um, there is a separate statute um, that is actually section, subsection 2A of the statute proposed that talks about a pecuniary interest. If there is a direct and financial. And so what is, yes, and, and so what is that direct, immediate, and financial interest here with the grandmother? Well, Your Honor, the grandmother is seeking to adopt both children. There are benefits that come along with adoptions of both children. There are costs that come along with adoption. But isn't that speculative as far as when that happens? Because I, I, I think as I read your argument, the argument is that if she she does, if she's successful, if she's successful in adopting the children, then she will be, she'll have to outlay money to raise the children. That is one facet of it, Your Honor. Okay. I think there are many, but... What will what explain for me what the others would be because I find that one to be a bit speculative because it starts with if. Well, Your Honor, it is it is true, but it is also a very natural consequence that if children are adopted, there is a direct pecuniary interest of that party. And it's just but in Goodman, but in Goodman, there was an actual existing trust, right? That was a, the the um, the children that were there were affected by that they already had a financial interest so what is the what is the actual financial interest that exists now any benefits that may accrue to the grandmother as a result of placement of one, one or both that sounds like an indirect benefit in goodman the, the the issue was with the adoption of a 42 year old girlfriend who stood to take a big chunk of the trust that was committed to the kids now that's a direct financial interest True, Your Honor. That's not what we have here. Even if the court disagrees that either of those two statutes are applicable, there is still the due process right that is discussed in Goodman. I think that's your best argument. The pecuniary isn't going anywhere, in, in my opinion. Yes, Your Honor. Well, I, mean, I, and I think this court is concerned that if nothing is done, that these two brothers will probably grow up never knowing each other. And that seems to me to be a problem. Yes, Your Honor. But I'm not sure how you get at it. That's your job is to convince us how to get at that. Your Honor, I believe that it's extrinsic fraud on the court resilient, resulting in a lack of notice to an interested party, that, uh, that a conscious effort is, is evidenced by this chain of events 
and that should give rise to a finding of extrinsic fraud resulting in a denial of due process. And in that case, Your Honors, the statute proposed should be overcome. It does not serve the legislative intent of the statute proposed to, to have a party be able to tactically avoid having one, one party in control of one of two siblings kept out of court, kept out of, and in fact, Your Honors, you will see that her motions to intervene have been denied, her, her motions to vacate have been not granted a hearing. I mean, she no longer has any direct biological connection with one of her grandchildren. She is caring for the other sibling. She's never been granted a minute in court to, to, to present arguments as to why that should, why some, something different ought to have happened. And there are manifold arguments that she has to present. There are really, really strong arguments, including her status as a legal citizen of the United States, which would confer benefits to the children as they as they advantages, serious and significant advantages as they grow. Um, and there's other evidence that we have um, that raises serious concerns about the fitness of the paternal grandfather to care for these children, all of which should be considered in open court in an evidentiary record that your honors can review and it hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened because of extrinsic fraud that we can demonstrate. So I, I think that under those circumstances, Your Honor, I, I do think um, that that extrinsic fraud resulting in due process should overcome the statute of repose because it, the legislative interests of finality and stability for the children are not served in such a case. And um, frankly, Your Honor, that would open floodgates of sorts, I think, to, um, to bad actors who specifically go about, I'm going to use the statute of repose not as a shield, but as a club, as a sword. And I'm going to go about denying everyone. And, and, and Judge, in, in particular, Your Honors, when, when we have a closed evidentiary record, I mean, it's one thing to do this in a criminal case or something where anybody can go to a courthouse and say, I want records associated with that. I mean, these are all confidential. So I think the potential for harm is great if this court allows the, grand, the, the paternal grandfather's efforts to succeed. Thank you. Yep. No, you're Thank you, Council.